know. Um, but um, as I said, the, a very kind introduction, um, because it certainly wasn't always the case that I was uh, considered to be uh, accomplished. In fact, quite the opposite. Um, and so uh, as a pupil at school, I had unidentified SEN um, and the consequence of that was that I was permanently excluded from school uh, first time at the age of 11 um, and then spent most of my secondary years out of education um, and not receiving any of the support um, that I should have been receiving. Um, and so I, I really understood the education system as a pupil to not be fit for purpose. Certainly it wasn't designed with pupils like me in mind. And I think that that's a broader problem with the education system um, in, the, in terms of both its design, but also the fact that it doesn't seem to cater well for everybody in it and doesn't seem to um, you know and sometimes actually does seem to judge people by the very things that are their known area of, of weakness by special needs or disability that I have experience of SEN um, but also as a SEN parent and what I mean by that is the double bind of being a parent with SEN myself which means that I've been um, well known for sending my children to school in uniform on Mufti Day um, or for being the advocate in court who's always got their phone on and so it rings in the middle of a hearing. Um, but I'm also um, a SEN parent in the sense that I have three children. Um, I'm pleased to say they're now all grown. As of last month, they are all adults, um, but with a, a variety of SEN. Uh, including ADHD, OCD, dyslexia, um, and also um, a complicated physical condition um, called systemic lupus with multiple organ involvement, which means I've spent you know, hours, days, and sometimes months at a time um, back and forth to hospitals. So I have quite a wide range of, of experience as a SEN parent. And I don't know about any of you, but my mind often looks quite a lot like this uh, with way too many things going on all at the same time um, and uh, not always making a lot of, of sense, quite a lot of chaos. Um, but what I learned from my square peg children um, uh, and I should say this is by trial and error because I had to get a lot wrong before I started to get it right to the point where there are now quite a lot of, you know, I'm, I'm pleased to say we have quite good successful outcomes, um, is that the problem with trying to fit a square peg into a round hole um, is not that the hammering is hard work and I, I'm not pretending for a minute that parenting children with SEN is easy or teaching them um, is necessarily easy either. Um, but it's not that the hammering is hard work, it's that in the process you risk destroying the peg. And I think one of the important things about SEN Talk is it's you know, focused on emotional and social well-being. And I think one of the real risks in the way that some SEN children are treated uh, through education is that they can end up the other end of it with very low self-esteem. Um, and all sorts of mental health distress and other difficulties, um, which actually hamper them even more in terms of being able to achieve successful outcomes, whether that's, you know, personally or, or academically. So as an education lawyer, then my job is to um, sort of square the circle and make that education system a bit more fit for purpose. And that's usually by um, securing uh, extra special education provision for children, such as therapies, um, or a different type of school for them. And for an increasing number of children at the moment, including uh, many children with autism with a sort of a demand avoidant profile, formerly known as PDA, or still known as PDA by some, um, is education otherwise than at school? Many, many parents at the moment are uh, finding that a home-based package uh, that's funded with appropriate provision um, works for them. And additionally to that, a lot of squaring the circle is about parents being more empowered 
to navigate some of the challenges that they face that I'll, I'll talk about a bit more. Um, and that's primarily through understanding better their child's rights and entitlements um, as a way um, to challenge things that are tricky um, and also to, to know what your options are and, and what you could be asking for. So um, in terms of the challenges then, um, I think one of the early challenges when people are at the sort of earlier stages of the SEN parent experience um, is the fact that home and school can often see things entirely differently. Uh, so you often have a position where, you know, the school thinks that there's nothing wrong, that, you know, parents are seen as, you know, overprotective and combative and, you know, helicopter parenting, trying to tell the school what to, you know, how to do their job. Um, and that, you know, the parent is seeing the child that comes home at the end of the day that's, you know, offloading all of their anxiety and, and distress, that's really struggling to keep up, um, that maybe is having labels attached to them that are, you know, wholly inappropriate and unkind, um, or that they're becoming socially isolated. So often a big problem is just getting an acknowledgement that your child has needs in the first place um, and then understanding better what those needs are sometimes or often even through diagnosis of one type or the other. Um, for those that are slightly further along in the process whose children have an education, health and care plan, um, and we can talk a bit more about that later, um, which is kind of considered sometimes to be the holy grail that if you get an education, health and care plan, then all will be well, your child will get everything they need and go to the right school for them. Um, often parents who've got one find that it's not initially worth the paper that it's written on because it's either written very badly and vaguely so that no one really understands what they're supposed to be doing um, and it's not enforceable legally. Um, or it's perfectly well written, but the local authority, um, you know, in combination with the school are not making sure that it happens. So the child is not receiving what they're entitled to. Um, and in any of those instances, then the school can be held to account as can the local authority, um, whose job it is to ensure that the child receives the provision. Um, and typically that's by judicial review um, and sometimes by um, the local government ombudsman. Um, and so a further challenge that's uh, obviously close to my heart because I have so much experience of it personally um, is exclusion. Um, and whilst I don't know, maybe it, it, it causes one to be a good lawyer and at least know how to argue later on. Um, but the reality is for many children and young people, it's pretty catastrophic um, and it can mean that they are excluded from school permanently or fixed term or internally there seems to be a huge appetite for putting children in isolation which I don't understand very well um, in terms of any beneficial properties of that that way of treating people. Um, it can be exclusion from trips, it can be not being allowed to participate in activities um, or being sent home early to cool off, that type of thing. Um, some of those exclusions can be lawful and some of them are always unlawful. Um, and so that's a common issue, particularly for um, children that are neurodiverse, so ADHD, autism, um, and also brain injured children, um, anyone who's got anything that impacts their ability to self-regulate um, and to inhibit their responses um, because of the frontal lobes of the, the brain are, are often impacted. Um, and so, um, so exclusions are particularly problematic. And, and I should also say that for uh, black and brown children, so typically from a Caribbean background or um, Bangladeshi background, um, but all, not just limited to those children, also children who are from more deprived backgrounds, um, and also children that are from particular communities like the traveler community, um, they can be at particular risk if they have that um, other characteristic, as well as having SEN, um, they can be particularly vulnerable to exclusion. Um, so whether it's because of exclusion or whether it's because of a physical or mental health problem, um, anxiety being high up on the list, um, sometimes with associated school refusal. Um, another common problem for children with SEN um, and, and a challenge for their parents is that they're out of education. So they should be in school, but but they're not there. And all children have a, a right to suitable full-time education. Um, the only time when 
a full-time school is not appropriate is where the child is unfit and that's not decided by their teacher or the local authority that's a medical decision by a medical doctor um, to say that they're, they're not well enough to be so that's a really common issue that there are way too many children uh, with SEN who are, are not in school and not receiving education otherwise or, or anything else um, and so challenges can be made to decisions that, that result in a child being left out of education. So I'm not going to run through this list in detail because you know I'm not a fantastic reader and it's quite a long boring list um, but what I will say is that there are a number of COVID specific challenges that have been arising um, recently um, some of them are now hopefully going to be things of the past like children who are supposed to be allowed to be in school and not being allowed to be in school particularly children that are vulnerable um, but I think moving forward there will still be some legacy regardless of how smoothly our path out of um, lockdown goes such as the issues for children that have been given teacher assessed grades or centre assessed grades for GCSE or A-level who um, who have SEN so the um, may not have received the right support along the way um, through their course um, and so there are likely to still be appeals and things going on around that um, as well as other issues around testing mask wearing and um and that kind of thing if anyone wants to talk to me about this in more detail then do feel free to post a question so as i say a lot of what i'm doing is talking about rights and entitlements and helping parents to understand what those rights and entitlements are and then how to enforce them and sometimes that's by way of polite persuasion and encouragement and other times that's through bringing legal actions and taking a more um, robust approach. So in summary, some of the key rights that there are for children with SEND are um, the right to SEND support, so that's special educational provision at school if you're in a state school um, and you don't have an education health and care plan, um, a right to reasonable adjustments if you are a disabled child, um, the right to have the provision that's specified in your plan, so anyone who's got a plan in section F of that plan, it should read like a list of things your child is entitled to. Um, the right to have suitable full time education I've mentioned, and then there's some other quite important rights, so the, the right to protection from harm. So children with SEN are often vulnerable to bullying um, and other forms of mistreatment, um, and so um, you know child protection issues can often arise. Um, they have a right to have their best interests at the centre of decision making, whether that's social care decision making, health decision making or, or education. Um, and then some um, sort of hu human rights are to freedom from discrimination, which is also an Equality Act issue I'll talk about a bit later. Um, and then I, I include these these last two and people sometimes think, well, you've got a kind of, you know, using a slammer, a, a hammer to sort of crack a nut type approach. Um, but actually, it's really important to, to hold these things in mind that um, there is a right to freedom from torture, inhumane, and degrading treatment. Um, and in the context of education and schools, um, then that can sometimes be things like, um, you know, sanctions that go on for too long or, or, or are inappropriate. Um, and in some instances can be being deprived the, the, the appropriate care and support. Um, and also the right to a fair trial. I, I should mention that I was a criminal defence lawyer for over 10 years. And, um, and so people think that I'm just sort of can't let uh, you know, criminal litigation go when I mention this, but actually uh, the right to a fair trial does include when a child is accused of something, um, particularly in the context of exclusions and things like that, having a right to um, have their say, having a right to access relevant paperwork and, and information um, and a, a reasonable and fair opportunity to present their case. So I guess some of the key questions that you may have, depending on where you are in the process and, and the um, needs of your child are, does my child have special educational needs? Um, so the fact that you're here at this talk tends to suggest probably yes. Um, and in broad terms, if your child has difficulty learning, and that's with any aspect of learning, so not just cognition and learning, so the academic stuff, but also communication and interaction, social, emotional and mental health, 
um, and physical and sensory needs, um, then they have special educational needs. It's highly likely that they do. Um, and if they have difficulty, then they may be academically and in other ways very, very able. They may be you know, ahead of their peers, um, but if they have a disability that prevents them from making good use of, of school property, i.e. they may be very, very able, but they have um, social, emotional and mental health needs that mean they uh, exhibit challenging to manage behaviour, that means that they keep being put outside of the classroom or outside of the school, um, for example, then they're likely to have difficulty accessing uh, the, the school setting uh, relative to their peers. Um, so um, really, if a child needs something additional to or different from um, their peers um, to be provided for them, then they have special educational needs. And so another question might be, given that it gives rise to some rights and entitlements, is, is my child disabled? Um, you know, and is it helpful to call my child disabled? And I think that there are some kind of political issues here as well. Um, so certainly in the neurodiverse community, um, there is a lot of thinking, which, you know, I, I agree with, that actually, if you're neurodiverse, um, you are, or neurod neurodivergent, to put it more specifically, um, that you're just a different type of human, but not a lesser or broken type of human, um, but just a different way of functioning and, and can be very able. Um, and also, there's the issue of the social model of disability. So, um, you know, we live in a society that should really be fit for purpose for all of the people that live in it. And if it's not, then is it the individual or the society itself that's disabling um, to its members? Um, and so I do subscribe to the social model of disability. Uh, but what I would say is that that's all entirely unhelpful when you're trying to get your child's needs met. So it's right, in my view, to say to your child, you know, that their brain's just wired differently, for example, um, and that they've got, you know, there are there are strengths inherent in their, their difference. Um, but when you're trying to get their needs met, then being disabled is helpful to you because it means that they then are protected from unfavorable treatment. Um, and they're also entitled to reasonable adjustments. And so um, a child is disabled if they have a physical or mental impairment. So if you have a diagnosis, it's, you know, you're most likely going to have a physical or mental impairment without much debate. Even if there is no diagnosis, if it appears that the child has lots of areas in which they struggle, um, then it's likely that they have a, a physical or mental impairment. So you don't need a diagnosis to be disabled. Um, and if that um, impairment has a substantial and long term effect, so if something's been going on for around 12 months or is likely to, that's long term. And substantial in law just means more than minor or trivial. Um, so for most ch children who are really struggling either at home or at school with doing things that are normal day-to-day -day activities for someone of their age, um, then it's likely that they meet the definition of disabled. And from the point of view of accessing support and help and protection, it's helpful to, to call your child at least to other people, if not to their face, um, disabled. Uh, you get protection from unfavorable treatment because of something arising in consequence of disability um, and also reasonable adjustments that I'll talk about a little more later. So if your child is in that fun place where they uh, have special educational needs, um, but they don't have an education, health and care plan, and they attend a state school, it's slightly different in an independent school, um, then they should be on SEND support. And that means they should be receiving the special educational provision that they need. That might look like occupational therapy, speech and language therapy, one-to-one -one support in the classroom, small social skills groups, little adjustments being made here and there. Um, and schools have a duty to use their best endeavors, which means really just try hard um, to make sure that the ch child receives that special educational provision. Um, and precisely how they do that or how they should do that is set out in chapter six of the Special Educational Needs um, and Disabilities Code of Practice, which anyone 
who has nothing better to do with their time can Google and read if you want to. It's always useful to know more than those who you're talking to, especially if you have a difference of opinion or at least as much as they do. So reading it, if you're able can be helpful. Um, and if a child's on send support, then there should be a model of assess, plan, do, review. That means that the school should be assessing a kind of baseline, where is your child at? And that doesn't mean where are they at in relation to their academic performance? Can they read and write yet? It means all of those other things I mentioned. So communication and interaction, have they got any friends? Can they you know, articulate their needs? Can they say when they're hurt? Um, that kind of thing. Um, and also sensory and physical needs for children that have um, really significant sensory integration um, difficulties, then the classroom can be a really, really stressful place. So it's sensory and physical needs, um, you know, maybe a physical disability, a wheelchair user, for example, um, and it's also um, social, emotional and mental health. So it's not just when they're looking at assess, plan, do, review, it's a, a whole, it should be a holistic picture. Um, a report should be, a record should be made, um, and usually that's kind of called a SEND um, support plan. They used to be called other things like um, an individual learning plan or um, similar to that. Um, all staff, and I think if you've ever had a look to have the pleasure of looking after a child that's a runner, then all staff, in particularly reception staff and lunch staff, should be made aware of your child's needs, not just their teacher or the Senko. Um, because if they're the sort of child that's going to get very emotionally dysregulated, if something doesn't go their way, or they're going to climb the fence and run off, then everyone really needs to know that. And everyone needs to know what the agreed way of working with that child is, who's, who's particularly vulnerable. Um, specialists can be involved at any time with SEND support, so an educational psychologist or a therapist. Um, parents should be being called in about three times a year, so usually once a term, to have a discussion. And that discussion should have been, you know, talking about, okay, we've, we've you know, done our assessment plan, we've been doing this for a while. Is it working? You know, is, is there any progress across these areas, you know, or is it actually are things getting worse or staying the same um, and at all times when you're dealing with a child with special educational needs um, the school should be thinking about this but also as parents it's good to be aware that you know an education health and care assessment which is the precursor to an EHCP um, should be being considered for a child and it's really important um, not to uh, for schools not to believe that they have to do endless cycles of assess, plan, do, review before they can start thinking about applying for an education, health and care assessment, because um, often it's very obvious that a child meets the threshold for an assessment um, and you don't need to wait to be able to um, produce lots of documentation for, um, for that. And I'll talk a bit more now about, about that process. Um, but essentially, what is an EHCP and how do I get one? So many of you will know this much better than me even probably. Um, but an education, health and care plan is a legal document. So it's issued by the local authority and that's your home local authority if your school is in a different um, borough. And um, the, the purpose of the document is twofold. One, it's to describe all of your child's needs and their current functioning. Um, and then it's to set out all of the provision that your child needs, whether that's therapeutic, one to one, maybe it's a you know small class sizes um, or a low arousal environment or highly specialist, well trained teaching. Um, and it also at, at the end then uh, names the either the school that your child should attend or college if they're a bit older, because um, it goes up to 20, the age of 25. Um, and it also um, so also sets out if there is going to be um, education otherwise than at, than at school. Um, and it's important to note that that um, naming of a, of a school or college can involve all different types of schools. So it can be your local um, you know, state school down the road that's a, a maintained mainstream school. It can be a, a small independent school. So, you know, um, an ordinary private school with small class sizes that's ordinarily fee paying um, for parents. Um, and it can be a specialist school. And there are specialist schools ranging across the whole type from those with 
very complicated physical needs like Trelaws, which is a, um, a day and residential school, um, to other schools like Fairley House that are for children that are cognitively able but maybe have dyslexia, autism, ADHD, that kind of thing. Um, and then there are residential schools as well. And there are both independent and state funded ones of those. But what's important about it is that if the school is named unconditionally in an EHCP, then the local authority pays for that school, including um, school fees where it would otherwise be a, a private fee paying school. Um, and they, they pay, for, they must uh, fund um, and arrange all of the, um, the provision that's detailed in their therapies and everything. So essentially, once issued an EHCP as an entitlement to whatever is written in that plan. Um, but it's important to understand that the way in which you get a plan is to apply to the local authority. Usually they have a form that you download. Um, and the threshold for whether or not they assess is whether uh, your child has special educational needs. And we've discussed um, that that's likely it, because your participants here, but also because of the, the definition. Um, and also when it may be necessary for special educational provision to be made in accordance with a plan. And what that means is that if your child requires roughly more than £6,000 um, of provision, which might look like 10 or 12 hours a week of teaching assistance support, um, or separately, it might involve two lots of therapies weekly say occupational therapy and speech and language therapy once a week plus maybe some social skills groups then that may add up to roughly that amount of money now the the amount of money is not important but what's um why it's relevant is because schools state schools are supposed to make the first kind of roughly six thousand pounds worth of provision from within their own budgets because they receive some delegated funding to do, deliver send support and it's only if a child has needs that are beyond that that they should be um in need of an education health and care plan but at the state, at the time of applying, you don't need to be able to prove that your child meets that higher threshold. It just has to be possible that they might. Um, and that's a, a very low threshold. And that's not the threshold that many SENCOs understand it understand well. Um, and part of the reason for that is because they rely on the local authority to give them information about um, that process. And there is a conflict of interest because um, local authorities are stretched in terms of their resources. There is often a focus on budget protection. And so it's not in their interest to issue more and more education, health and care plans, because then that means them spending more and more money. And so they will tend to discourage and say, no, go away and do lots of cycles of assess, plan, do review, uh, rather than say, yes, let's do an education, health and care assessment. And the actual test in terms of issuing a an education health and care plan at the end of all of that um, is is it necessary so that question of you know can this child's needs be met from a school's own resources or not um, is the question that the the uh, local authority should be asking itself and if they don't ask themselves the right questions in the right way then that the tribunal um, will address that question and so i won't talk you through this in detail but if you apply, there is a statutory time frame for um, the EHC assessment process, which is a 20 week process. It's regularly the case that that um, period of time um, lapses without progress having been made. Um, and that's often because the uh, local authorities' desks, at least in the old days when people were in the office, uh, looked a little bit like this. So there was um, you know, more work to be done than was humanly possible probably. Um, and so unless your case managed to make its way to the top of the pile, it probably wasn't gonna get dealt with within those um, 20 weeks. It's important to know that if things don't happen on time, then that's a breach of um, the law, so a breach of statutory duty. Um, and so there are things you can do to, to move that along. There is an appeals process. So if you're in the position where you apply for an education, health and care assessment, and that that's refused, as it usually is, regardless of merits, because of this budget protection thing, then you can appeal. 
Um, if the local authority refused to issue an education, health and care plan at the end of that assessment process, then you can appeal. If you don't like what the plan says, um, if you don't agree with the school named, and that's quite often if you want something that's at the more um, specialist and expensive um, end of the range, or if you want an independent school, um, then you can appeal. And then at other times, for example, if you have a review and the outcome of that review you don't agree with, then you can appeal, um, or if they try to cease to maintain the plan. Um, so I won't talk you through the procedure for appealing, but I'm very happy to talk. The slides kind of set out the things that are, that are quite important. Uh, the only thing I will say about both the um, assessment process and also appealing is that the most important aspect of that is um, building a persuasive body of evidence. So whenever you are trying to get something done, then the better the evidence that you have, um, then, then the more likely you are to succeed. Um, I should say that where it's necessary to appeal, the odds are very much in parents' favour. Um, at the moment, it's about two thirds of cases at tribunal that are um, being conceded by the local authority um, and so settling in some way that's you know uh, satisfactory to parents um, and of those that go to hearing about 92 percent uh, succeed so your odds just on in general terms if you need to challenge are good and also it's important to understand that for some ways that local authorities work it appears as if um, unless you appeal then they don't take you seriously um, so in terms of sources of evidence Subject access requests, which is writing a letter and saying, this is a subject access request. Um, I would like you to send me all personal data that you hold about my child can be made to the school or to the local authority. I've put in the slide the relevant bits of law. You might have heard about the GDPR or data protection. Um, medical professionals that are currently involved in your child from CAMS, for example, can be useful sources of information. I certainly know that my youngest uh, child has got out of quite a few sticky situations because of a helpful, um, well-crafted letter uh, from CAMS pointing out the connection between a behaviour uh, and his disability. Um, independent reports are the most effective way of um, persuading uh, the local authority in relation to an assessment or persuading a tribunal at appeal. Um, unfortunately, they are extremely costly. Um, and so if they're cost prohibitive, um, then it's useful to know, although the, it's means tested and uh, quite stringently, that legal aid can be available. Uh, there are a couple of practices that, that do legal aid work for education because they, they those are the only ones who hold um contracts to do so um and what they can um what they can what that can fund is advice and, and um help with preparation um of an appeal case and also paying for those expert reports um and that can be a huge saving um and a huge you know a, a big lifeline if you can't afford to um, pay privately for them um other ways of getting um evidence might come through making requests of the tribunal to make case management directions and all of these kind of more technical things I can go into in more detail um, if, if it's appropriate and, and helpful to do a, a workshop on appeals um, but when, whoever you're talking to what, at whatever stage always ask if they um, any sort of educational psychologist or therapist always ask if they do tribunal work because the standard of their reports is, is different um, and um, it's also important that they are prepared, should it be necessary, uh, to go along to a hearing to, um, you know, so that, that what they say can be supported by their, their oral evidence if there are any questions about it. Uh, so reasonable adjustments are probably one of my favourite and most useful things. Um, essentially, um, if a uh, and I'll say school, but it's important to know that this is, you know, that this applies to any other organisation as well. Um, that what the Equality Act does is it says that if, um, you know, let's say a school has any kind of provision criteria or practice, which just means a way of doing things. Sometimes it's helpfully put in like a behaviour policy or a uniform policy, but sometimes it can just be the way that they arrange things, the way that they choose to uh, operate you know homework clubs or uh, make have uniform requirements or something um, 
But if they have a way of doing things, we call them a PCP, that puts a child, a particular child at a disadvantage because of their disability, um, then there is an obligation on that school to take reasonable steps to avoid that disadvantage. And so an example of that might be, you have a child that's got sensory needs um, and so can't cope with horrible textures and stuff. And so finds wearing a uniform uh, really stressful and, you know, really really distracting from their work etc um then that would be that child you know that would be a, a a practice of requiring children to wear school uniform that applies to everyone it's not inherently um you know prejudicial or or, or uh, unfavorable um but because it applies it applies to everyone but for this particular child with sensory issues then wearing of that uniform puts them at a particular disadvantage and so the onus there would be on the school to take reasonable steps to avoid that and that might be by relaxing the uniform requirement allowing them to wear their own clothes uh, for example um it can also be most importantly um for a lot of parents um, that it can be adjustments to the behavior policy um, and to give you an example with my um, with my youngest son for example he went to a um, selective independent secondary school and with very strict policies around things like having your equipment with you having your kit having your pens and pencils and the right textbook and also handing your homework in on time those are all things that are fairly standard um in probably in most schools and particularly that, that type of school um but if you have executive function difficulties so organization is difficult remembering things are difficult even when you've done your homework and it's in your bag remembering where to take it can be difficult if you're that kind of child then um you know that's a real challenge and so in that in that instance a reasonable adjustment was that um my my child didn't get sanctioned for organizational things at all so that didn't lead to the detentions that then leads to all the other things that, that go with it um but also had um, a spare pack of things. So teachers would keep a spare pencil case with stuff in and a spare textbook. And so instead of the kind of negativity that comes from being sanctioned when you arrive at your class without out of any of the things that you need, then there was support instead to say, look, here you go, it's not a problem, you know, and you can hand it back in at the end of the lesson. So it was always there. Um, and those are simple things um, that you can do. Sometimes adjustments can be things like dropping the number of GCSEs that you're taking or not being required to do homework at all, um, or, you know, moving a classroom, um, for example, from the top floor um, of a building down to the ground floor. And I don't mean the physical classroom, but the lesson that's being taught in there so that a child that has difficulties with physical mobility, where there's perhaps not a lift, doesn't have to navigate that um, environment, but is able to, to access the lesson. So there can be all sorts of things, I've written a um, a 101 reasonable adjustments on um, the ADHD Richmond website. And what I should say about that is you don't need to have ADHD for it to be relevant. It's probably more relevant to children with um, neurodevelopmental conditions, um, but also has lots of things that might be helpful to other children. Um, and um, and I should say that. Um, and this is coming back to the beginning of, of me not having always been quite so accomplished, but still having that those residual kind of uh, challenges myself with my own executive functioning um, that I was um, and I've recently um, co authored a book and, and contributed a chapter um, and my you know my chapter was about education and um and adhd and girls and um and so the editor suggested that oh yeah we should adapt that um 101 reasonable adjustments that you've got on on that website um with their permission because they, they now own my 101 reasonable adjustments um into you know append it to the book um only when it, we went through the editorial process um it turned out that i had 96 reasonable adjustments plus um, an additional five that were um, that were duplications um, and so actually they're not 101 reasonable adjustments although in the book I'm pleased to say I've, I've added in a different a different five um, but anyway so I've talked through um, a variety of different issues that arise um, and um, you know Centalk and I have been thinking about um, ways in which we could be more usefully helping parents um, and so um, it seems to me that if um, there are particular issues like you're in the situation where you want to appeal 
or you're in a situation where your child is being bullied and you want to know how to deal with that, then it would be more useful to go into a kind of deep dive where we could actually go through how do you fill out the relevant application form, how do you draft that letter, that kind of thing. Um, and so I'll whiz through any of them that, that I haven't mentioned already, but you can you can see them for yourself. Um, so things that we haven't talked about today, like admission, ordinary admissions and exclusions. So where you don't have any HCP because then you're in a different system, um, but where you're um, applying for admission or you need to do an admission appeal, SEN can sometimes be an important relevant part of that process. Um, Equality Act claims we've mentioned, um, but obviously there's there's the, the the opportunity to go through that in more detail to understand how without having to rush off to to you know bring a court case against anyone, um, it's usually possible to persuade um, a school to do reasonable adjustments or importantly to stop unfavourably treating a, a child and discriminating against them. Um, a lot of the work that I do when I'm hired to effectively be a bit of a rot wall, uh, Rottweiler, which is where my um, my background, my early days background probably comes in in, in handy, um, is about is in the area of complaints. So um, often that's complaints to school. Even more often, that's complaints to the local authority. Sometimes it's complaints about the local authority to the local government ombudsman and then to a whole range of regulators that I won't list. But also sometimes um, it can involve the Charities Commission, Department for Education, that, that kind of thing. Um, then there's judicial review. So judicial review is a really um, useful tool for holding public authorities to account. So you can't usually use judicial review, for example, to go to an independent school and challenge their decision making, but any state school and the local authority in particular, where they're not doing things on time, haven't provided education for a child, for example, then judicial review, usually just a pre-action protocol letter at the beginning of that process is typically enough to, to sort things out. And it's also important that unlike other areas of education law, um, that you can often get legal aid um, based on the child's means, as long as they are of limited means as most children are, rather than parents. And so that, that's an important thing to be aware of. Um, I haven't gone into today breach of contract or negligence. Negligence usually in a state school, um, although it can be in an independent school, breach of contract is only where you're at an independent fee paying school and you're paying those fees. Um, then if the school fail to exercise reasonable skill and care, um, often that's around health and safety, can sometimes be academic, um, often around child protection issues, um, then action can be taken. Um, and I don't usually deal with the detail of those myself, actually, but we have specialist litigation and, and negligence teams that do. Um, and then school governance I haven't talked about because essentially school governance is me advising schools. So it might be an interesting topic to, to talk about. Probably the others will be more helpful. Um, but a lot of the work that we do for schools is around writing policies, helping them to manage risk and that kind of thing. So um, understanding what their obligations are, because often there's when things go wrong, it's because the school hasn't understood uh, its obligations um, very well. So. Um, I, I understand that um, either after this session or even during it, there'll be um, an opportunity to complete a um, questionnaire where you can just indicate if you um, were inclined to come to more sessions, um, what they might focus on so that it's more targeted. We can offer some that are targeted to you know, what's most relevant to people. So finally, um, where can you go for help? Um, so charities such as SOSN and IPSI offer free and independent advice. I believe that some of SOSN's work, there may be a fee for, but it's a, a donation, um, as I understand it. Um, and that's where they're doing more casework. But in general, advice is free. Um, and independent and for example I used to be a volunteer for Ipsy and my colleague another one of my education law colleagues Lenka um, is, is currently a volunteer for SOS Send so we, we rate them we think that they're very good I know that parents have difficulty sometimes getting through to them to get a call but if you can then then it's very worthwhile um, send yes services so that's the local authority free service. Um, I would say if you can't access anything else, then probably go for that. If, if you can access independent charities, I would say they're more likely to give you robust legal advice. Um, and 
are you know are not going to be concerned about saying stuff that um is going to be especially problematic for the local authority that they're employed by um in you know that that sendias workers are employed by um there are legal aid solicitors that i've mentioned um legal aid is means tested and limited in the way that i mentioned but if you can access it then then you know absolutely do because um it can be a costly business. Um, so private solicitors like me, um, it's a different thing from having a charity support you. When a charity supports you, you um, run your own case, usually with some support. Um, with a private solicitor, they run your case for you, but it's extremely expensive. And for anyone who grew up in an environment like I did, it's entirely cost prohibitive. Um, and that's very concerning to me and why I like doing talks and um, and, and getting involved in other voluntary organisations because um, it shouldn't be the case that people that can afford it can buy a better outcome for their child with special educational needs because there are just so many children with special educational needs that don't have um, you know sharp elbowed parents who can advocate on their behalf or you know pay for the things that, that are sometimes needed so that's you know that lack of access to uh, provision and and justice really in education is is very worrying uh, so there are support groups which um, my experience of support groups as a parent um, was it was the first time that I stopped feeling isolated as a as a SEN parent myself um, and can be really valuable sources of information and, and support um, coaches um, there are sometimes coaches for different types of, of disability um, typically they are not providing legal support um, I actually trained as a coach and do still have a, a very small coaching practice um, and it's that's more about the kind of non-legal side of things um, and just helping to support and manage parents through what can be a really tricky time um, and finally, just in terms of sources of support, there is the um, Equality and Human Rights Commission. Um, and as well as providing some, some advice, they can um, on occasion fund private solicitors to bring Equality Act claims. And I believe they now have some in-house lawyers as well who can do that. So because that type of claim is really expensive, if it gets to that, it's just useful to have in the back of your mind that there may be some um, funding support available. So I think that brings me to the end of my slides. And so 